I focus on how to make my team successful and let them know that that is my focus and my priority. Because if I make them successful, then I'll be successful. A network to me is not how many people I have in my phone database. A real network to me are the number of people that would do something for you when it's not convenient, right? If there are issues or concerns you've got, you have to use your voice and actually raise them because if you don't, then who will? Shelly Archambault is the former CEO of MetricStream, an experienced CEO and board director with a track record of accomplishments, building brands, high-performance teams, and organizations. Ms. Archambault currently serves on the boards of Verizon, Roper Technologies, and Okta. She is also the author of Unapologetically Ambitious, Take Risks, Break Barriers, and Create Success on Your Own Terms. It's a book that will inspire you and provide the tools to enable you to fight the battles, make the trade-offs, and create the life you want. I'm gonna write it down so I can just share. What are the steps and things that you can do to improve your odds to get what you want out of life? And that's why I wrote the book. Miss Archambault has over 30 years of experience in technology. She is also a strategic advisor to Forbes Ignite and to the president of Arizona State University. And she serves on the board of two national nonprofits, Catalyst and Braven. Some people actually take the time to write down a plan. You know, all right, here's my goal, here's my plan. But very few people make decisions every day consistent with that plan. And that's where I believe the power is. Shelley offers invaluable advice about recognizing opportunities, finding helpful mentors, and developing supportive networks. Her experience working on multiple boards has also given her deep insight into what characteristics make valuable board members. You have to be intentional. You've got to be accountable. You have to make sure that you are actually doing the homework so that you understand the company, the issues. Let's listen in as Ms. Archambault shares the secrets to her success. Well, good afternoon, Shelley, and welcome. Well, thanks very much, Gary. I've been looking forward to this. Well, we're pleased to have you at this microphone. You've been so successful as a leader during your career at IBM, at Blockbuster, CEO uh, of Metricstream, board member at Verizon and other companies. I'm just wondering, when did you have time to write your book, Unapologetically yeah. Ambitious? <laughs> Right. It actually does take time, too. I actually waited until I passed the CEO baton, and then I wrote, then I wrote the book. <laughs> when, when did the idea of the book start occurring to you? Probably uh, about 20 years ago. Um, what, happened, yeah, what happened, Gary, was throughout my career, I've tried very intentionally to be available. So when people reached out to me, and said, oh, can I pick your brain, meet for coffee, get your advice, et cetera. I always tried to do that because I wanted people to see that, hey, I'm just Shelly. There's nothing special about me. So if I could do what I did, so can you. But what happened is as I took on more and more responsibility, I just didn't have time to meet with everyone. Uh, I still responded to their text messages, emails, you know, LinkedIn's, whatever, but I just couldn't meet. And frankly, it was hurting me. I thought, oh, I just want to share. And so I said, you know what, when I get to the point of phase two, which is after I passed my always on job of being a CEO, then I'm going to write it down. I'm going to write it down so I can just share what are the steps and things that you can do to improve your odds to get what you want out of life. And that's why I wrote the book. Yeah. And the title makes that point clearly. And, um, uh... I've referred the book, of course, to uh, to all my daughters and sisters and wife and so on. Let's back up a bit and learn a, more about you, Shelley. What was your life like growing up? Oh, goodness. Um, my life was one of uh, a lot of challenges. My father didn't have a college degree and he had four children. My parents had four kids in five years. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> right. And so to support his family, he was always taking on new opportunities. So we moved. I lived in seven different states before I got to high school. So wow. you're always right. So you're always a new kid on the block. And oh, by the way, this happened to be in the 60s and early 70s. And that was the time when a lot was going on in civil rights wise. And for as many people yep. that felt there should be civil rights, you had just as many that didn't. And they were 
frankly, very willing and open to let a little black girl know that she wasn't welcome and wasn't wanted. I was bullied. I was abused. I was beat up by kids in my class. I mean, it was just not, it was not good. So that's why I realized very early in life that the odds just aren't in my favor. So if I want anything out of life, I'm going to have to figure out how I improve the odds to actually get it. Well, you've done a terrific job uh, improving the odds, and we'll we'll get to that a little bit later. But what did the young Shelley think about leadership? At what point did you begin to think about leadership? I craved respect. I just wanted people to respect me because I wasn't getting respect. And what I found is when I actually helped people, they then got to know me as a person, and they started to respect me. So I learned early that helping was actually a good thing. So I'd offer to help people. Then I, then I figured out that I was really good at organizing and pulling things together. And people actually respected that too. So I was like, okay. So by the time I got to high school, I was joining all kinds of clubs and organizations. More than that, I was leading them. Hmm. There's a point at which, and you talk about this very nicely in the book, that that you really wanted to be a CEO, not just a leader, but a CEO. When did that kind of work into your thinking, Shelley? Yeah, actually that was thanks, believe it or not, to a guidance counselor. So picture this, right? You're a junior in high school. We all remember this. You have that conversation with the guidance counselor that everybody has. Are you going to college? Are you not going to college? Yes, I'm going to college. What do you want to do after college? And I was like, I don't know. In my family, it was all about get good grades so you can go to a good college so you can get a job. Um, I just want to be able to earn enough money to keep my thermostat at 72 degrees, eat out of restaurants and travel, right? That was what I wanted. And she said to her credit, well, Shelly, what do you like to do? And I said, oh, that's easy. Clubs. I'm in all these organizations and I like leading them. And she said, well, Shelly, clubs are kind of like business. You pull people together and you get things done. And I said, oh, great. Then I want to be in business. And I like leading the clubs. So when I looked up, the people that led organizations were called CEOs. So this little naive 16-year-old was like, you know what? I'm going to go be a CEO. <laughs> I love it. So you talk in the book about core personal strength and just this whole discussion about a young person growing up and, and uh, being involved in uh, kind of gaining respect and so on. You have a core personal strength that seems to me to be really excellent. Did you recognize that as a differentiator from the beginning, Shelley? Uh, no, I did. I personally didn't recognize it from the beginning. But I do feel, you know, I do feel that when people, you know, ask you or ask me, Shelley, you know, what are your superpowers? You know, we talk about strengths. I believe my strengths are two things, really, um, which is one, courage, hmm. and two, discipline. So, it's the courage to take risks and the courage to go after things um, when you're not comfortable. And then it's the discipline that's required to actually follow through on the plan. You know, a lot of people set goals, Gary, I find, and, and some people actually take the time to write down a plan, you know, all right, here's my goal, here's my plan. But very few people make decisions every day consistent with that plan. And that's where I believe the power is. And that's really where my power came from. Mm -hmm. You're very organized, very disciplined, as you say. How do you handle unexpected opportunities uh, that crop up? Uh, great question. When something unexpected come, comes up, first of all, I look to see whether or not it's an opportunity or it's a risk, right? If it's an opportunity, then it's just reflecting on, do we have, do, do I have, do we as a team have what's required to actually take advantage of it? And if I don't, can I get it, right? And if I can get it, or if I have it, then I'll go after it, understanding what the potential downside could be. And vice versa, if something comes along and it's actually a risk, it's the same thing. Okay, what do we know about this? How are we going to handle it? Do we have the right skills, capability, knowledge, whatever it might be? And then put the plan in place to be able to handle that risk. Many people talk about a work-life balance. You talk about work-life integration, uh, which is an interesting point. Can you tell us more about your thinking of that, Shelley? I actually hate the term work-life balance, Gary. I hate it. And the reason I hate it is 
when you think about a balance, it's a thick structure, right? Thick structure, a bar, another bar on top, two weights on each side that are static. If it's in balance, they never move. Well, I don't know about you, but my life goes like this, up and down and around and curves. And if I'm going to be judged on a fixed static, am I holding this in balance while life is going crazy? I mean, I have enough to be felt guilty about. I don't need this artificial picture, right, in my head. So, no, I don't believe in work-life balance. What I believe in is work-life integration, which means I'm one person. I'm one person. I got a lot of stuff to do personally, professionally. I take my personal priorities, my professional priorities. I put those two together, and then I reprioritize ruthlessly, which is the key, so that I get done what's important across my life. And what that means is there are going to be some things, personally and professionally, that aren't going to get done. So you either have to find somebody else to do them or learn how to live without them being done. Mm -hmm. You make the point in the book that you have to tell people what you want. Uh, to let them know. Can you give us an example of how that's worked for you? Yeah, definitely. And you're right. I believe tell the universe what you want and need so the universe can help you. When I was at IBM, I wanted to, I was working towards being a CEO and I'd done the research and all of the people who reported to the CEO that were line executives and ran P&Ls had all the international assignments. But more importantly, most had done it when in Japan. I didn't know what was special about Japan but I knew that that's what I needed to do. So I started telling people, hey, by the way, I'm interested in doing an opportunity in Japan. By the way, I love that, da, 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 right? When people say, what are you interested in? What you want to do? I told everybody. And certainly and two years later, I got a call from a guy, Tim McChristian. He said, Shelly, I remember you saying you were interested in Japan. Is that still true? Because I've got a job that fits your skill set and blah, 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 blah. And next thing I know, my family was moving to Japan. You have to tell people. They can't read your mind. In your book, you talk about managing your career. Uh, And again, you're a very disciplined, organized person. You're willing to take risks. How do you think about managing your career? At what point did that start? And and what does that look like to you, managing your career? Mm. It started right from the beginning. Again, it goes back to I knew the yards weren't in my favor. I mean, here I am. I land at IBM. And I'm all excited, right? I'm getting my career going. And I look around and IBM's got like 110,000 employees. And I'm thinking, all these people probably want to be CEO of IBM. So I had to figure out how was I going to stand out, get the skills, do whatever. It's, it's, a, it's a competition. So you, wait, how I do that? I do the research. I set a goal. I want to be CEO. Figure out who they are, what their skill sets are, what their backgrounds, what path. And that's why I started out in sales. Because trust me, coming out of Wharton, nobody starts out their career in sales. Definitely not (laughs) selling computers, right? My friends thought I was crazy. You're going to do what? Right? (laughs) But but every single CEO at IBM started out in sales. So I figured it had to be the path to power. So managing your career is doing the work to figure out what skills are required, what experience is required, what have other people done? and trying to find what I call the current that will lead you there. Because if you swim with the current, you go a whole lot faster than if you're swimming against the current. There's a great chapter in the book called Challenges Are Our Strength. Can you give us an example of how that's worked, Shelley? Oh, definitely. So I just mentioned that I'd gone to Japan, right? I got this opportunity to go to Japan. Well, the only challenge with going to Japan I say the only challenge, but the only challenge going to Japan um, is the conversation that I had with my boss really illuminated it. So the boss I was leaving had worked in Asia for a long time. And he said, Shelly, how much do you know about Confucius? And I said, all right, Peter, you're trying to give me a message. So just give me the message. He said, all right, there are three things that are important in Japan to be successful in business. The first is wisdom. Wisdom is age. I'm all of about 34 or 35 at the time. I don't have wisdom or age. Okay, fine. Zero for three so far. Um, (laughs) Right? Now, the second thing is being male. I'm not male. Now I'm zero for two. I'm like, okay, so what's the third? I'm thinking there's only three things. I'm already zero for two. And he says, the third is intelligence. He said, Shelly, you only have one going for you. So you better figure out how to maximize it. I was just like, 
okay, this is my raw, raw, go off and be successful. So anyway, so here's what happened. Here's what happened though, Gary. I get to Japan and I do what I normally do, which is I know that people are going to underestimate me. I know they're going to assume that maybe I'm in the job for reasons other than my capability. So I always approach every new job the same way, which is I go in, I learn. I have a servant leader approach, which is I focus on how to make my team successful and let them know that that is my focus and my priority. Because if I make them successful, then I'll be successful. So I went in and did my normal thing. Well, we got, I mean, I took over a division that was like almost bottom of the chart in performance. So we had a lot of work to do. I get in, we're doing a lot of stuff. About three months into it, my boss calls me into his office and he says, Shelly, what are you doing? I mean, you've been here just three months and you've already been able to make some changes, get motions going. What are you doing? It usually takes people six months to figure all this stuff out. And I was like, well, I'm doing what I usually do. I come in, blah, blah, blah talk about servant leadership, blah, blah, blah. He goes, yeah, 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 but what are you doing? He was looking for like some kind of cookbook. What I learned, what I learned is that the fact that I'd been a minority in business my entire life in the U.S., when I went over to Japan, I was still a minority. So right. all the skills that I had learned about how to operate as a minority actually were strengths in Japan because most people yeah. came over and they'd never been in an environment in which their reputation didn't come with them, in which was because they said something, people would do it, right? That, was, that didn't exist. So absolutely, the things that you learn, the challenges that you have along the way are really what gives you your strengths and your resilience later on. Well done. So in the book, there's a section about five tips that you're sharing with us, all of which are good ones, and I'd love to cover them now. The first one was is about mentoring do mentors find you or do you find mentors? How do you think about that? Mm, I've always been proactive. So I'm a big believer in adopting mentors. And this I talk about, as you know, Gary, a lot in the book. I don't believe in asking people to be my mentor. Um, because I find that when you ask people to be your mentor, they have the opportunity to say no. And a lot of people say no because they're busy, right? And they don't know if you're worth the investment. I mean, mentoring... And all that takes time and energy. And people are always like, ooh, not sure, right? So I don't ask them. I basically just start treating people like a mentor. I start light and easy. You know, I ask questions that they don't even have to think about. Like if I'd seen you speak, Gary, I might come up to you and say, oh, Gary, I saw you speak. You did a fabulous job. I have a speech coming up in 30 days. Can you just give me one tip, right? Well, you wouldn't even have to think about it. You'd say, oh, add some humor. Look people in the eye, right? Whatever it might be. Fine. Yeah. Here's the key. The key is I take the advice. I'm amazed at how many people don't take the advice. Take the advice. <laughs> and then, it. right? And then once you take the advice, let you know. I can write you a little note. Gary, thank you so much for that tip. That was the best speech I've ever given. And I give you a lot of credit. Now, here's what happens when you do that. You probably don't even remember the conversation because you didn't have to invest, right? It was just a quick response. You may not remember. But now you got this note from this person who really got some value from you, you feel good, right? You feel good. Well, yeah. as Maya Angelou says, people won't remember what you say. They won't remember what yep. you do. They won't yep. remember how you make them feel. Odds are, when I ask the next little tip, you'll actually respond. Yep, that's well said. Now, um, the next tip is about building a network. And I'll say that, you know, we hear that a lot. Uh, in your case, you seem to be an exceptionally outgoing person. You're also very relationship oriented. Do you have an edge in building a network because of that, do you think? Or what do people do if they're not quite as outgoing or thoughtful as you are? Mm. Uh, yes, I think out, being outgoing helps, but it's not required. So the key is, again, it's to be intentional. There are a lot of outgoing people that don't necessarily have a big network. All right. So it's not they're not necessarily connected. And being intentional means creating relationships. A network to me is not how many people I have in my phone database. A real network to me are the number of people that would do something for you when it's not convenient. Mm. All right. That's mm. how I define a network. So that's only going to happen if they feel like they have a relationship with you. So you have to create a relationship. And that's just not a, hi, how are you, shake hands and gone. And the way I create relationships goes back to helping. I learned early in my life, you know, when you help people, it gives them a chance to get to know you, you the person. 
versus the persona, right? And therefore, it gives people a chance to create a relationship. The term plan your life is something that is referenced in the book, um, pretty much throughout the book, really, one way or another. <laughs> how, how do you think about how do you think about that? How formal? How formal is planning your life? I mean, do you write it down or you just think about it? I personally think it's important to write it down. There's something about writing down your goals and steps and whatever that makes it real. When it just sits in your mind and you think about it, it becomes a bit more fungible. But, but, but writing it down then allows you to put timelines on it, which, oh, by the way, if you write, if you have a goal and you write down a plan, but you have no timelines, it's just a dream. All right. You have to have timelines so that you have milestones to know if you're on track or you're not on track. Otherwise, you wake up and you're 37 or 43, 51, and you're like, gosh, I'm just not where I thought I would be, right? Because you just kind of slip, slide it along. Having timelines kind of keeps you honest. Shelley, I'd like to move to the role of a director, if I could. You've been on multiple boards. You are on multiple boards now, uh, Fortune 500 to uh, not-for-profit boards, um, what does it take to be an excellent director? That's a really good question. You know, being a board director is the same as having a, a job. It is a job. You're, you have a set of responsibilities and you're accountable. And your responsibilities are to represent the shareholders, to ensure that the company has the right vision, the right strategy to execute that vision, and the right team to execute the strategy. That's really the job of the director and make sure you're doing it in a way that's consistent with laws, rules, regulations, gut, right? All those kinds of things. So to be a good director, it comes back to just like to be a good employee or a good leader. You have to be intentional. You've got to be accountable. You have to make sure that you are actually doing the homework so that you understand the company, the issues, right? You're spending time and that you're using your voice to raise questions right? If there are issues or concerns you've got, you have to use your voice and actually raise them because if you don't, then who will? And mm -hmm. you have to be there to support and advise the management because mm -hmm. you want them to be successful. It's not a matter of you're like holding them to a test where you're trying to catch them in things. No, this is a teamwork effort. You're trying to ensure that everything is aligned so that the company can be as successful as possible. Mm -hmm. Let me build on that with this question. I've always thought uh, the boards that I've sat on that a term of chemistry or fit, kind of knowing your role uh, is important. And in the companies that I've uh, been a director of, my role is a little bit different, everyone. Do you find that? And, and how do you think about that, Shelley? I actually agree with you. Uh, although I'll separate a little bit from culture and fit. Because I do think it's important that boards have kind of a diverse group. So it doesn't always mean it'll be the exact same fit. But I do think it's important that you know your role. Um, one of the questions I always ask when I'm interviewing for a board is, and is to the CEO or to the lead director or chairman, is, you know, what role do you want me to play? Why do you want me on the board? So that I know what my lane is. You know, I tell people, stay in your lane. Boards, they want to know what you know. They don't want to know what you think. <laughs> And what I mean by that is we all have ideas. I mean, we're smart people, right? We're sitting on the board, we all have ideas. But the board is, has a very finite amount of time to get accomplished what they need to get accomplished. So just because I happen to be an expert in maybe in engineering and cybersecurity, whatever, but you know, I have ideas for marketing, they probably don't want to hear my marketing ideas because that's just based upon gut, right? It's not based upon experience and background, et cetera. So, you know, stay in your lane. Make sure that you are being vocal in those areas in which you bring real expertise and real experience versus just opining on everything because you have opinions. And that's what I mean by they want to know what you know versus just what you think. So I completely mm -hmm. agree with that. This is a, a little bit of an open-ended question, but um, how do you handle a difficult situation that's going to require going against the grain a bit. Uh, we've all been in that situation, but and everybody handles it differently. But how do you think about that, Shelley? When going through a challenging time, my belief or my approach, whether it's on the board or it's been in leadership, is to peel the onion 
And what I mean by peeling the onion is typically if you ask enough questions and get to the root, you'll find that you actually have common commonality. And what I mean by that is let's say there's a big disagreement on maybe a strategic direction. All right. Some people believe this, some people believe that. And that's important on a board because the company's got to execute right in one way. Well, you start asking questions to say, well, where do we agree? And you will find a root point where everybody does agree. And then typically it's just because of a set of assumptions or misinformation or a lack of knowledge that we then start to branch right in different areas. So I peel the onion until I find where we're all agreeing and then build back up. Right. Because I find that when people actually have the same set of information, the same data, right, shared experience going around, you pretty much end up in the same place. What's the difference between serving on a on a not for profit board and a and Verizon, let's say? So I find that when you're on a nonprofit, you tend to be actually more actively involved in the operations of what's happened, happening rather. Or on the corporate board, you're not. You're really mm-hmm. driving it from a governance standpoint. Do you find sitting on boards has been helpful to your career? Oh as yeah. As a leader? Absolutely. I started serving on boards when I was 42 or 43. And I was the CEO of a company at that point. And it absolutely helped me in terms of CEO because it allows you to sit in a different seat and therefore understand what boards want. It also gives you, frankly, a whole nother lens and visibility into another set of problems. And while that might sound counterintuitive, like don't you have enough problems? But in watching how other organizations handle and deal with problems, there's always things to learn that you can bring back. So yes, I have found it to be very helpful. Shelly, this has been an awesome interview as expected. Thank you so much, Shelly. We very much appreciate your time. Very welcome. Thanks so much for having me.